What's happening, everybody, and welcome back to the Funky Brain Podcast. My name is Dennis, and this is my funky brain, and we're going to have a nice talk today. I'm pretty excited about today's episode because we spend most of our time on the Funky Brain Podcast talking about drugs and alcohol, but we're going to talk about food addiction, which plagues a huge part of the American population today, and it's not addressed quite as much as an addiction. But, you know, eating because of stress, boredom, fear, worry, anxiety, loneliness, whatever. That's all ways that we define emotional eating. And I know I've been a victim of it. And it's been said that almost 40% of the people I've eaten in response to stress in the last 30 days, and I definitely have, I can admit to that. So um, I admit that's the first step in anything, right? But uh, I know I'm not perfect. But I have an expert in the world of food addiction, and more importantly, in recovery from food addiction. She's a researcher, a speaker, consultant, author, educator, and founder of Phoenix Six, which I'll let her tell you about here in a couple minutes. Her passion is helping women who struggle with food addiction and food addiction symptoms like overeating, food binging, food cravings, anxiety, withdrawal. Ultimately, she helps women to reach their highest potential and lose weight by reprogramming their brain, which I love here on the Funky Brain Podcast. But Dr. Kirsten Grant, how are you doing today, Dr. K? I am good. What about you? I'm awesome. I almost called you Kristen. <laughs> yeah, it's Kirsten. Yes. <laughs> Kirsten, Dr. Kirsten. So awesome. So what got you into the field of addiction and of food addiction? Did you have your own struggles? I currently struggle now, especially now with, you know, just everything that's been going on with the pandemic. I don't have full blown, full, full blown food addiction. Food addiction is something that's really like on a spectrum. And that's what people are unaware of. Um, Another preconceived notion and mistake that people often assume is that people that suffer from food addiction are plus size or overweight. And that's not always the case either. The uh, biggest struggle is usually with those symptoms ranging from how extreme they are to sometimes they're just not as bad. But I became immersed in the field of food addiction because I lost my mother to food addiction in 2016. And what was so terrible about it was she had lost the weight once about 20 years ago. And at that time, I didn't understand what food addiction was. Food addiction is still a new field. But um, at the time when 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 I lost her in 2016, she had grown to such a large size that when we met at the funeral home, we were not able to find a normal size casket for her funeral. And we were afraid that we were not going to be able to have the funeral because of her large size. And to make matters worse, once we finally found a casket and had the funeral, she was so heavy that they almost dropped her at the burial. So this was really my light bulb moment. I had already been researching about different reasons why people gain weight, lose weight, put it back on. And my research journey has been spanning over really 20 years. But that's really my light bulb moment. That was it right there where I said, I need to find out what is really going on. Because when she passed away and You know, when a person, a loved one that's close to you passes away, you have to do the thing of going through their things. What I found shocked me. She had three dresser drawers filled with nothing but diet books, nothing but magazines, everything dating back to before I was ever born in the 1970s, not to tell my age. (laughs) And that's when I realized that this is an addiction. This is something where you can't fully controlled. This is something going on with the brain. This is not a lack of knowledge. This is not a lack of willpower. This is not a matter of push the plate away from you when you feel full. This is something greater and more. And that's what launched me into creating my own study and scientific study that was completely online. So there was no reason for women to not be able to (laughs) partake, no limits there. And in four weeks, they managed to really reduce their food addiction symptoms and the anxiety and the food cravings and the overeating, the emotional eating, the stress eating. And even though I wasn't looking for this, I just ran the numbers anyway, just for fun. They lost weight. 
And in some cases, they lost as much as 20 pounds in that four weeks. Yeah, that's awesome. What I love about your approach, it's something that I read in the intro, which is that ultimately you help women to reach their highest potential and lose weight by reprogramming the brain. And this is also Mm -hmm. core to my coaching practice as well, because it's so important to realize that the food, the alcohol, the drugs, the shopping, the porn, whatever the addiction is, it's not the real problem. It's what I'm using to cope with the real problem, which is my, my thinking, my funky brain. So tell us about that, the reprogramming the brain. This is about more than just your willpower. If it were just a matter of you deciding that you don't want to imbibe in, like you said, the porn, the alcohol, the shopping, and you just simply said a couple of affirmations, and then that was it. This is about your pleasure centers and how your brain processes and taps in to those pleasure centers. And essentially what we want to do is number one, recognize that there's a problem. That's, that's for starters. And after that step, start analyzing and identifying what your triggers are and everyone's triggers are different. That's the reason why I don't believe in a um, cookie cutter approach because everyone is different. We're different like snowflakes. So I can't just simply look at you and say, all right, why don't you just simply avoid sugar and then that's it and then make a hard cut and then you'll be successful. That's not going to be the key. Some people in my industry will practice and stay, say abstinence. And for some people that might work. My study, what I presented in the realm of food addiction was a reduction by 20% and every single week. And then only really focusing on one major item at a time. That way your brain doesn't go into shock and the neurological pathways and those gratifying centers such as dopamine, serotonin, that makes you feel so good. We begin to starve that out. Imagine almost two chasms, two rivers, and this chasm is being flooded rarely when you reinforce that negative behavior that you don't desire. If we begin to dry up that chasm because we're not allowing ourselves to have that item that we want and we're slowly reducing it back weekly, that makes it easier to dry up that neurological pathway and chasm that's already been built into your brain and those reinforcement centers. And then you can replace it with new behaviors and fill this chasm over here so you're not feeling deprived. Does that make sense, hopefully? Oh, yeah, that was beautiful. Well said. I love that. And then one of the other problems, and because I do a, a coaching for addiction and recovery and stuff too, and I love everything that you just said, but It's not, uh, what happens if we don't do what you're talking about, we end up with cross addiction, right? So it's like, I might not overeat or something, but I'm now I'm going to go shopping or I'm not going (laughs) to drink, but now I'm going to eat or whatever it is. So so everything you said is great. Reprogramming everything, filling up different areas and making a reduction instead of the abstinence, because that's overwhelming for a lot of people. If you say I, and especially uh, addicts, if you have an addictive personality, if you tell me to do something or not do something, I'm going to do the opposite just because that's my makeup. <laughs> a good example, like what you stated to not focus on something. Well, the subconscious mind, it doesn't process the word not and no. Our minds work with images, stimulation, visual. So if I sit there and share with you right now, do not think of a purple tree. What did your brain just do? (laughs) (laughs) I thought purple everything. Yeah. You're thinking of that purple tree because I said, do not Think of the purple tree. So what if we tap into, and this is part of the reprogramming the mind. What if I begin to immerse myself, step one, in your life, learn about some of your background, learn a little bit more about how you were raised and what potentially some of those triggers are. Fast forward and help you imagine where your end point is. Don't worry about this part, the bridge, in terms of how to get there. How do I stay on the bridge getting to over here? This is where I am right here where I currently stand, here is where I am over here. I have a very beautiful diagram here with my hands shaking <laughs> in order to help you see. This would be right here where you want, where you are currently, your current condition. This over here, my right hand, is where you want to be, your desired end state. 
What most people are lacking is that bridge to go from here, your current condition, to over here, your desired state. And the key to that bridge and being able to tap and access that bridge anytime you want with or without your coach, once you have that training under your belt working with your coach is accessing the subconscious mind. So things like what we just talked about, it, I don't know if you knew this or not, but when you say not automatically, well, I'm not gonna eat sugar. All your brain says now is, oh, I could go for some sugar. <laughs> I'm not going to pick up that drink. Now, all your brain is thinking about is how glorious it would be to have a drink. I'm not going to go shopping. I'm not visiting that porn site anymore. You just told your brain, yeah, let's do that. That sounds great. What are some of the practices that you use to get people to be able to make that bridge? My practice is I look at it as a toolbox, a, a toolbox or a tool belt. So it's always customized to the person. But in my program, what I usually do is that I give you the basics so far as what the habits are and the tools that are available to you. In addition to, there are certain chemical additives that are placed in food that for people that suffer from food addiction, it's been scientifically proven under an MRI scan of the brain, they are more vulnerable to the effects of these two food additives. So I actually give you a physical list that I compiled over one year of visiting the grocery store and looking at individual labels based on the feedback that people share with me saying that these are my weakest areas here combined with scientific research and evidence. And then I got to work writing down and looking at each and every single tempting item. So this is why I share with people, you can have a cookie, you can have ice cream. We're just going to make sure that that ice cream or that cookie doesn't contain that ingredient. So now you have the tools that you need in order to facilitate the change. Now, how do I keep you there? This is where we might use certain tools such as what's called EFT tapping. So those days that you're feeling overwhelmed, and let's say it's 2 a.m. I call that the raccoon eating in the garbage bin hour. <laughs> I may be asleep depending upon what time zone you're in. <laughs> I don't want you, once I, once I share this information with you and train you to utilize in that routine, I don't want you to be confined to our next meeting again. I want you to be able that if two o'clock AM, something happens in your life and you're triggered, you can immediately get to work. So tapping, EFT tapping is one tool. Another tools I like to use and resort to is hypnotherapy. Another tool that's also extremely helpful is called time regression technique and dynamic. And tapping into these various tools along with utilizing NLP, neuro linguistic programming, and sometimes I'll even whip out the old fashioned cognitive behavioral therapy in theory. <laughs> you know, once again, these are just, this is just a sampler of some of the things that I usually resort to and utilize to help the women that I talk to and converse with and some brave men. <laughs> right. Well, I love all that stuff. You know, and one of the things and reprogramming the subconscious mind is definitely the key to success, you know, at, at least identifying things going back in. And we have to think, and everybody remember who's listening to this is like our subconscious minds were programmed over maybe decades, maybe four or five decades of doing things over and over and over and over again, training our brains. So when we come in and say, all right, all right, I have this problem, I admit that. So that's step number one. And then we have to make some changes. Now, some of those changes can happen quick, but some of these we need to reprogram the subconscious mind. That it takes time. And it comes from doing things differently over and over and over and over and over again for an extended period of time. You know, I always say it's 100 miles into the woods and it's 100 miles back out. But the good news is that 100 miles back out, it doesn't have to take as long or be as painful. Like there's yes. tools if you have a coach to help you along the way. And then I love what you said. I don't want you to be confined to have to come back to me again next week or whenever. I want to train you to be independent, right? That's the goal of this. Like other conventional uh, doctors in medicine, they want you to be dependent on them. Mm -hmm. I want to train you to be independent. So what are your thoughts on stuff like uh, amino acid therapy and things like that? I'm not very familiar with amino acid therapy. I'm aware of a lot of different therapies out there. And my philosophy on it is 
as long as it's safe, ecologically safe for the individual, for the planet, and it helps you move closer towards the solution for that stage, that chapter, and that point that you're in at your life currently, then I'm in favor of it. I do admittedly lean towards scientifically proven methods unless intuitively there's some reason that I say, you know what, I've seen this work. I don't have enough scientific evidence and data. If it's okay with your subconscious mind for us to explore this today in order to get you through to the next area that you need to get through and get to your goals and get you healthier, then let's give it a shot if, it, if nothing else is working. But that's really just my philosophy on it. What, what I believe and what I've seen after working in this industry and, I, and studying this for over 20 years is like what you mentioned, the amino acid therapy. Anytime that I found or if you find that you have a hunch after you look at the data and you really look at the methodology and the approach to solving a certain problem, there's usually, usually something there. Remember, there was a point where acupuncture was called quack science. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. 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 Now there are so many studies out talking about the benefits of acupuncture. Hypnotherapy was the same way. All of these things. And I came across these things way before they were called this. And even when I first came across that information, I've been reading about this stuff since I was 15. <laughs> and I, even then when I read about, it, I said, this makes sense. I believe this will work. Fast forward years later, I never knew I'd be getting trained and certified in it and, <laughs> and all that stuff, creating studies in it. So I always believe, even if there's no scientific evidence for it, but you feel it works for where you are in your stage of life and it's not harmful and it's ecologically safe, go for it. Yeah, great answer. I love that. And I think an important thing, and I, I talked about this in my book, I talk about it with clients all the time, is like the most important aspect of all these like practices that we're talking about is that most of them do work or we, we wouldn't hear about them. These programs, yeah. diet programs, a lot of them are rapid weight loss programs, aren't necessarily health programs, but they do work or we wouldn't hear about them. But the most important thing is, because you can talk about all the different diets that are out there, and it's not necessarily fat that's killing us or sugar or salt or even McDonald's. The problem is excess. The problem is always excess. It's like, there's nothing wrong, like you said, with eating a cookie or ice cream. But the problem is if I'm eating like too much of that stuff, then it becomes a problem. But it's the same thing with uh, the solutions to all these things is consistency. That's the secret to all these things. So when you're trying a program like mine or yours or some diet program that you hear about, the paleo, the, key, the keto, whatever the diet of the month is, it's like keep, you do it and then continue to do it. Because people are like, I tried that diet. It didn't work. Well, it did work. You go on the diet. You do what it says. You stop eating crap at two o'clock in the morning. You exercise more. You lose 30 pounds. And then you're like, this is great. So I started eating cheesecake again. Again, I put it all back on and I'm like, well, that diet didn't work, but it did. You, you have to keep continuing to work. It becomes a lifestyle. Looking good is a byproduct of living well. And I try to instill that in people all the time and living well. We're, we're talking about food, but looking good is a byproduct of living well and in moderation with everything. But another thing, like we, we hear what we want to hear as humans. So so we see on the news reports all the time, dark chocolate is really good for you. It has antioxidants. Well, that's great that I can eat two pounds of dark chocolate every day. <laughs> Same thing, red wine. Oh, it's so good for you. This is great. I can drink four bottles of red wine every day. So we hear what we want to hear. Like we don't know, like the red wine is good for you. So maybe if you have a, a glass a week, there might be some health benefits if you're living a healthy lifestyle the rest of the time, right? Mm -hmm. That's the truth, but we don't always hear that. So tell us about some of the struggles that you have to deal with in life that, on a regular basis. I would say my biggest struggle would probably be perfectionism. And I want to add a slight caveat there. And this um, is something that I've encountered working with many people and having conversations with so many people. The reason why whatever habit it is that you struggle with is so difficult to disentangle yourself from like my perfectionism, is because it has served you to a certain extent. You've received in some shape, form, or fashion positive reinforcement. Even if it's negative, 
or negatively perceived to someone else that you might talk to about it. Allow me to give you an example. I admit I'm a wee bit of a perfectionist. The bright side is it has driven me to accomplish the things that I've accomplished. I didn't want to just simply sit back and accept my mother being so large that she couldn't fit in her casket. And that was the fourth family member that food addiction claimed in my family. I couldn't stand sitting back and just saying, oh, well, the typical thing that runs in my family is we're all big boned. No, 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 no. <laughs> I agree with that hundred percent. So what, what can I do to get closer to fixing this, not only for me, but for other people that might suffer from the same thing. And I did go on a war path of really researching through, I would say, at least 200 psychological theories to arrive at the theory that I used when I wrote my dissertation at that time and created the study. And that was in addition to all the other areas that I already researched and was well read in epigenetics, neuropsychology, immunology, things of that nature. So the result of my perfectionism was both good and bad. I created the first online scientific study that helped food addicted women actually in four weeks control food addiction. The bad side is towards the end, I had ear infections without provocation constantly because of pure exhaustion, because I was relentless about it. So you see the duality there, something good came out of it. My perfectionism served me. There was a wee bit of positive reinforcement, but on the negative side, my health suffered. Yeah, interesting stuff. And I think that's really common. I think that it's not uncommon to see like really highly successful people like sacrifice their health to make money or situations just like that, or like you're talking about. In order to get here, I have to give up something here. There's sacrifices that need to be made. I think on, a, on some level, I think it is true. You know, we only have 24 hours in a day. So it's like, I need to use that time, but we don't have to suffer at such a deep level, right? And I agree with you and that, and I'm glad you brought that up because at that time I wasn't practicing NLP and EFT uh, tapping, but since I've been trained in it now, I can go back and look in retrospect and I wish I had had someone to talk to me about it, but I couldn't because I didn't have any space. I couldn't hold space for that at that time. But now looking back, if I were to tell the younger version of myself something, I would ask her, and this approach can work for anyone, okay, why do you think it's a good thing or why do you work so hard? So then the next answer would be, well, because I need to get this done. Who says you need to get this done? Why do you think you need to get this done? Well, the only way I can get this done is to work really, really late and really, really hard. Who, according to who, who says you have to work really, really hard and stay up? two nights in a row and then crash after 48 hours of staying up. Who said that? Where did you learn that? This would be a conversation I would have with my younger self. And then after taking some time to really look at things and perform an exercise call time, time dynamics, I would be able to look at my timeline from going backwards to earlier and younger all the way to the future. And I would have realized that, ah, I learned this behavior from my mother. I would often see my mother working for a project called SMP, which I don't even know what those initials stand for anymore, but at the time I really knew. <laughs> but she would be working tirelessly, ceaselessly at her job because she felt that that defined being a good and productive person. Good, productive people work hard. They work almost until they drop. So you see what I did there in just in my case, you have to find out where these beliefs come from and then start finding ways to identify how to change that belief system. You still accomplish your goal, but you have to shift that belief system a bit. Really well stated. This is all learned behavior, you know, it all is. Of it. So, and, but when was it learned? Right. And that's what we were talking about earlier with the subconscious mind. It could be, I've been doing this for 40 years. And if you tell somebody who's fighting it and goes, no, because, you know, what you said was, where did it tell me that I had to work all night? Well, probably on a TV commercial while you were eating McDonald's. 
or something like that. There's mm-hmm. some where we get it from every angle, whether you turn on your phone, it's like, oh, you need to eat this and do this and work this hard and invest in this and all this stuff. Everything we do, we're like inundated. So I think awareness is the first step, knowing that we don't have to follow the mass consciousness. And, mm-hmm. and I think that everybody, and I'll never in my life again, be without a coach. And I'm not saying that because I'm a coach or you're a coach. I'm saying, and if you don't hire a professional coach, that's fine. But an accountability partner in your life, somebody is not emotionally attached to your stuff that can see things from here. So when you say, oh, this is going on, when I'm talking to somebody, they're like, this is what's going on in my life right now. I can say, well, that's not really what's going on. Or how about if we look at it from a different angle? You know, Mm -hmm. and I think we all need coaches in our lives to keep us accountable. I have a coach. I'll never be without one the rest of my life. I resisted having a coach for a very long time because of, and here's the um, gloriously, comfortingly deceptive thing about YouTube University. (laughs) All of this information, and it doesn't have to be YouTube, not picking on them, but the internet, the gloriously deceptive thing about the internet and all these self-help books out here is that it lulls some of us, not all, but it lulls some of us in the pursuit of that information into a sense of accomplishment because mm-hmm. you're learning so much about this thing and that thing and that thing, but it's only unidirectional. It's not bi-directional, meaning it's not giving you feedback customized to your situation. And that author of whatever video you're watching, whatever article you're reading online, that's good to get you started. And you're way better off than someone who has never heard of anything ever before, but it just still doesn't get the job done when you're stuck inside of this box, which is your reality. And you don't see anything else as you look around inside this box. What a coach does, it, the coach helps you look inside the box through a certain line of questioning based on their genius, their talent, their gift in order to help and heal you. And then you begin to see maybe a hole in that box that you didn't see before. Or maybe you blow the box wide open and you see solutions and opportunity, whereas before all you saw were boundary lines, borders, oppression, and no solution to your problem. That is what having a coach for for me and for the ladies that I've worked with, that's what having a coach means to me. And it's something that I resisted so much because I felt I was smart, I can figure it out myself. No, you can't because you've got blinders on and it's, it's innate. We, we naturally have blinders on. The smartest person can have blinders on. That's why you need a coach to help you remove the blinders that you don't even know that you had on. Yeah, well, I'm blown away. I'm tapping out. I can't follow that. <laughs> Like you just nailed it, everything. I mean, you're such an inspirational person and I really appreciate that um, you came on the show today to tell everybody awesome. about that. Beautiful person inside and out. So if uh, people want to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? I have a website called edibleaddiction.com. They can reach me there. I also have a show called The Dr. Grant Show and we're on live on Instagram on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. That's usually the cooking show segment for people that want to get a couple of tips if they're food addicted, cooking tips to make healthier food and make it fun. And I answer your questions live. And the show is also released, re-recorded, pre-recorded version on Mondays and Saturdays via Instagram and my website, edibleaddiction.com. Awesome. Well, I hope that I get to be on your show someday too. Definitely. You will. I look forward to it. So thank you so much for being on the Funky Brain Podcast today. And thanks everybody for tuning into the podcast today. I hope you learned something new. I did for sure. And have a great day today. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. So you can't think your way into a new way of acting. You have to act your way into a new way of thinking and being. Hi, I'm Dennis Berry, best-selling author, speaker, and life coach for addiction recovery. So many people are stuck in their addiction, whether it's like drugs or alcohol or food or shopping or sex or money, and they think they could just stop or try to figure it out on their own, but they don't change anything in their lives. Nothing changes if nothing changes. 
In order for change to happen, you have to change something. My clients will be like, oh, I'll stop tomorrow, or if this happens, then I stop, or someday I'll just give it up. And then they just sit around and think, 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 and hope for different or better results, but it doesn't happen. You have to take action. Action most people aren't willing to take. People don't become willing until they're in enough pain, me included. And unfortunately, they wait, and they wait and time passes by. Even if you are willing, you don't even know where to begin. And that's where I come in. In my best-selling book, Funky Wisdom, A Practical Guide to Life, I talk about the how approach. How do I get sober? How do I stop doing drugs? How do I become healthier? How do I have more successful relationships? How do I become more financially successful? And the answer is how. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. I have to honestly admit that there's a problem. I have to honestly admit that things aren't going well and there needs to be changes. And then once I do that, the door opens and I become open to seeing new ways of living. And then I become willing to make those changes. You can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. That's why I'm here to help. And you know, I've been working with clients for over 15 years and helping them get clean and sober and change their lives and achieve inner peace and success. If you or somebody you love is struggling and doesn't know where to begin and how to make those changes to get to where they need to be, give me a call. Not tomorrow or in a week from now when you are hungover and your life is falling apart. Call now. Start making that change today and you'll be glad that you did. I'm sending you love and good vibes. Have a great day today.